Harold Gray. Yeah. He used to go see him with a little off and any, a little off and any. Um, Harold Gray could, Gray could drink, and so finally at one party, uh, Walla noticed that um, uh, Harold Gray was going, leaving the room every so often. So he says, I followed the son of a bitch. You know what he was doing? He was giving it the finger, then going back and drinking some more. So he says, I went in there and said, I'm going to kill this guy. He's faking drinking and throwing up so he can out drink us all. <laughs> Imagine a cartoonist would do a thing like that. That's, that's cheating. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Huntington, the town I'm in. I haven't left home. I'm Ever? A, well, I went to New York to get married, make a fortune, and came back two years later. And how'd it go? Well, I'm still broke. <laughs> you, you had to ask. So what did you, uh, you wanted to be an illustrator when you started out? I trained to be an illustrator. Where? I went to, went to Grand Central Art School. I studied with Harvey Dunn. Harvey Dunn, one of the top illustrators of that period. He came out of the N.C. Wyeth School and uh, he painted with a great big brush about that wide and a cigarette and he would boom, paint. And uh, Mario Cooper was in the class and Harold von Schmidt and you name it, they were, they were there. Uh, intimidating, very intimidating, but uh, I was there with Jack Lady. Ever heard of Jack Lady? Mm -hmm. John Lady? And that was in 1930, in the Depression times. And, but When did you finish there? Uh, I managed to get two years in. I worked as a janitor and a hall monitor and a bouncer. It was in Grand Central Terminal. And the people would go to track 17, take the elevator up, and come in and monitor the classes, the new classes. So. They, I found out that they needed a mo whole monitor, so they called me the bouncer, Joe the bouncer. So I managed to get a couple of years in, and then from there I went to working in, as a gardener in Vanderbilt's estate and painting boats and things like that. And um, by 1932, the Depression had really set in, and you know what they did? They started comic books, and that's where I met Vin Sullivan and the more fun comics and. How'd you meet him? I found an ad in the New York Times, and I went in, and there they had an office with a couple of big rooms and one desk, and a, a beaten up, uh, born again secretary, and and Major Nicholson, former pulp writer, who um, was always broke and always had a suitcase, a little briefcase, never had any money. Five dollars a page. We were doing comics, and I did the covers. I just happened to be there. There's a chance to draw on. You never had to worry about getting paid. Oh, well, I didn't have to worry about getting paid because I was there. I decided the money was scarce, and I saw guys come in and out and screaming for money, you know, laying down on the floor and crying and kicking. I figured I wasn't going to do that. I could, but I wouldn't. Not a very good actor. So uh, I sat there, and I got my check every week. I, I never ended up owing me not a cent. I, and I got a wonderful experience. How many people were on staff when you were there? Well, it was just uh, Vin Sullivan, uh, Whitney Ellsworth, who was the art director on Superman and Major Nicholson, and this uh, Born Again secretary. And you were the only artist on staff? I was the only one on staff. Uh, on staff, well, uh, I mean, in, in if house. there was money, I was on staff. Otherwise, I was freelancing. In fact, I bought my own drawing table. That's how, how tough times were. Bought my own drawing table and sat down and uh, they would say, hey, I need a cover, and I'd do a cover. Going through some of the covers that you did, I noticed that uh, early on they got simple and then you became very kind of Art organized in the terms of the way you, you portrayed the story on, a, on, on the page. Did you learn a lot while you were doing that? They did, really didn't uh, tell me what they wanted. They just say, uh, go ahead and um, we need a cover, you know, and I, I was, my mind was Joseph Conrad and all that, uh, Les Miserables, and I was known as a poor man's Norman Rockwell. I was, uh, you know, not good enough for this and not good enough for that. Maybe good enough for ten dollars a shot. So they they were wonderful. They just said, "Go ahead." And I only had one cover turned down. What happened? Well, that was a um, a cover. It was a skull-like cover, and a, a skull with a red. Drape, just two colors, black and red, and a, a skull. And the guy, the skull had a knife, 
and it was dripping blood. Oh, it was hard. At that time, they actually turned it, turned it down because they knew the public wouldn't accept it. And today, they, they say, boy, that's a pussycat. Um, the, the, only had, the only time they ever turned anything down, and um, uh, they were done in a hurry, you know. It was a case you had to get it out and um, get the money and run. There's a shot of a uh, character grabbing a necklace with a top hat. Mm -hmm. Is that supposed to be anyone? Uh, no, um, at that time, you know, I would base it on stories that uh, were on radio. There's no such thing as TV then, on radio. And um, you would base your ideas on old movies. Was it Nicholson, though? That wasn't Nicholson, no. That was supposed to be the greatest cover because in the background I had a mirror. And in the mirror you saw the two cops. Wasn't that great? I thought, what's great about that? It's been done a hundred times. But they said, oh, the, the guys, uh, collectors, you know, the kids would come up and say, gee, I remember that cover. That was great. I said, great, that was. I think if you tell a story in one picture, and That's you can right. portray it That's right. quickly and easily like that, people really take You notice, to it. notice that a lot of those early f covers I had still had a dry brush. I came out of the pulps. And the pulps was a uh, pocketbook size uh, uh, little stories, and they would. The drawings were done on, and printed on very poor paper, worse than toilet paper. You know, they would, they had to be a lot of, a lot of blacks. You couldn't, if you drew a line, a very thin line, it would come out about that wide. So uh, a lot of uh, good people came out of the pulps, and there was a good place you could make all of seven dollars an illustration, the double spread fifteen. So I really advanced. I went from fifteen dollars down to five dollars a page, drawing five you know, five panels or six panels, and doing the lining it up, doing the lettering, the inking, the penciling, and the color guide. It was good practice for you, wasn't it? <laughs> That's what they told me. You read the book. <laughs> um, did you know any other guys who were working there, Leo Malley or any other color? color Leo color? used to come in all the time. And Leo, I th always thought, I always thought he was so old. He wasn't that much older than me. But he looked like uh, Boris Karloff in the Mummy, where they never took his hat off. It was the old, you know, the old cartoonists with a cigar and a hat on their head. And um, I always thought he was so old, but at that time, a lot of the illustrators, successful illustrators, had to come back, actually, to the comics, and they were glad to do it for five dollars a day. Joe Giello was talking about John Flanagan, a pen and ink man, worked for Blue Book, and one of the best. And he actually did, if you look in the anthology, Gerber's book, he has actually got covers in there that uh, he did. And I'm sure I did them for $10 a page. And if he got 15 you know, they, they didn't have any money. You could get uh, do a comic book for $10 a cover for $10, but you would get a book free. And if, you, if I had saved the early books, I wouldn't be here talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> There are a lot of guys who became really kind of uh, stock and trade in the, in the comic book business. You know, Siegel and Schuster and, and Bob Kane and, and, uh, and yeah. Bill Eisner were all working in comics early in those days. Did you run across any of them? I, uh, Siegel and Schuster, they came in as kids. They, they were 17 years old. I, by that time, you see, I was, um, I was maybe 22, 23 years old. I was an old, the old man in the business because all the kids today like uh, Cy Barry. You've heard of Cy Barry? He remembers my stuff, you know, he was a kid. He's 15 and 16 years old, a little rat copying all my stuff. And I was the old man in the business. Everybody came through there. Uh, Siegel and Schuster came in, of course, they were only 17 and they had Dr. Arcult and they had the Federal Men and they had, they had this other thing about uh, Superman, you know, the guy with the cape, to go in a telephone booth and take off his cape and go to the moon and Shazam and everybody, they wouldn't buy it. Syndicates wouldn't buy it and then because Vin Sullivan and uh, Wood Ellsworth and the Major, they needed copy and they were just, uh, they bought it. They weren't sure it was going to be a success. Oh, they, they knew it. Would. Everything, when I came up, everything was captains, cops and robbers, robbers, Terry and the Pirates. And once in a while you were thrown an Arab and you couldn't do anything with the Jews. They, they, would, they owned the book, so. I had to, I couldn't pick on them. I was uh, one of the earliest men to put 
blacks into my covers and in my stories. Did you know that? They were the heroes. They was in Steve Conrad. They wrecked the boat, and of course, one of the guys in the water is Negro. It wasn't just because they were in darkest Africa. No, no, no. No, I was a real liberal. In the early days, I used to go down uh, 14th Street and uh, where they printed the new masses and they had the communist books drawer and go in and read all the books on sex and uh, and the revolution, of course. The revolution and sex is the same thing, if it's done right, that is. How long did you stay in the comic book business? Well, off and on, you see, I, I guess the first thing um, I did was um, maybe 1936, I did a thing called, for more fun comics, called Acorn Antics, about little uh, elves who are painting the leaves, cute little, a double spread, uh, cute little elves. And then I went and uh, ghosted uh, before Don Drake on the planet Saro, and then uh, I uh, gradually went in there and sat down and they said, hey, we need this. So, you know, you would create uh, Hanko the Cowhand or Steve Conrad or uh, all the different... Did you run into Bert Christman at all? Well, Bert Christman, I met him. By that time, I was into comic advertising. Comic advertising was at the bottom of the comic Sunday spread, comic section. They would have ads for Everready Flashlight, all of the, the toothpaste, cigarettes, and everything. Uh, book stuff, and I met Bert Christman. I remember the gray bar billing, and he had a leather Eisenhower jacket before Eisenhower even knew about it, and he was blonde hair down his back and short, and uh, he was on his way to go out with General Chenault and the Flying Tigers, fly a plane, which he did, and it was shut down. You know the story? He was shut down by the Japanese, and that was used in Terry and the Pirates. So there were certain schools of drawing. There was the um, Milt Kniff. Everybody was in there doing the Milt Kniff type of background stuff and um, Bud Briggs type of thing. Al Dorn. I sort of fell in between all the rest of them. I tried to do my own thing, crude as it was, and you know, eventually you'll find out where you belong, you know. My um, ability was not, I could do comics or I could do straight stuff, but I sort of fell in between and I, I had the uh, sort of like um, Mort Drucker, that, that type of thing. Did you go back and forth between the two? I tried to, and I, whenever I could, in advertising, you could do the Mort Drucker type of thing. The mad the kind of, you know, with a more um, thing, a hand would be more animated than um, Norman Rockwell. He was a great cartoonist. Uh, Al Dorn, you know, the stuff he would do. You know, if he would take a hand, and Stan Drake, if, he, he would use photographs. He was, a, he was a production man. Everything was, you know, like this and like that. Well, uh, uh, my Ford, I think, was uh, fell in between. And I, and I found that you had to do a straight stuff. And my stuff suffered many times, you know. When I would draw people like that, they would look like that. Or if I would, uh, I could be myself, why, well, uh, I would, you know, uh, things are foreshortened and make it semi comic. Make it alive, or hope to. So you ended up getting mostly in the advertising business for... Uh... Tom Johnstone. He was the art editor of the old Evening World downtown. And he's the guy that turned down Smitty when Smitty uh, Wallabird came in and uh, brought the strip in. And at that time, people worked in the office. Everybody did their strip for their own particular paper. He turned down Smitty, and uh, Walter Byrne tells the story. He said, I came in, and he, he said, Mr. Johnston, did you look at my strip? And he says, I haven't got time to look at every strip. So Walter said, here, give it to me. I'll take it uptown, and I'll sell it to the Daily News, which he did. He went up to Captain Patterson, and that's and the story goes on from there. So you ended up working for Johnston and uh, was it Cushing? Johnston and Cushing, yeah. When I went in, like everything I, I touched, they, it fell apart. I got in the comic books and they went kaput until the war came along. And then Johnstone and Cushing, it was Tom Johnstone. He was on the 35th floor of the Commerce Building. And he had people like Bud Briggs, Joe King, Sacron, and um, eventually Dick Brown, Stan Drake, and myself. And he had these comics to turn out. And then the first week I got letters. The, if you get letters from 
Tom Johnstone, Jack Cushing, and a guy named Walsh. And they were trying to ease Walsh out. So Jack Cushing, whose father invented the tracer bullet. Now that's a handy thing to invent. Something you can really, you know, you shoot somebody you and you can tell where you shot them. You know? <laughs> Gee, boom, I shot him in the groin. Hey, that's fun. So he had the money, so it became Johnstone and Cushing. And um, for about 25 or 30 years, they went along and made a lot of money till uh, TV came along. You've heard of TV. All of the little characters I did in advertising, you know, Betty Bite Size and the Trailer Twins. And now you looked and be in full color on TV. And no, no one read comics anymore at the bottom of the comic section. Well, and the other thing is they kept cutting it down and down, so there wasn't much space to look at. That's right. Um, did it pay a lot better than comic books did? Mostly? I went from $5 a page to $300 a page. Is that good? Well, overnight, it was, uh, my, wife, my wife was very happy. By that time, I got two kids, and, uh, you know, they'd, they'd, I worked at home, and the kids would be holding on your legs, and, you know, Dad, get some food, you know, I'm hungry. Uh, go buy me a uh, bubble gum or something. So I had to work, <laughs> make money, keep them from off my back. Did you ever do any comic strips outside of advertising? Yes. Did you work on? I worked uh, 1937. I was married. Been married 60 years. Believe that or not. Really? Same same girl. Same girl. Um, 1937. Uh, John Strebel, who did uh, Dixie Dugan. J. P. McAvoy. There's a name in the 20s. J. P. McAvoy created a character called Dixie Dugan. She was a showgirl. And almost, uh, like Blondie, almost immediately when they started off, they were real whoop de doo girls. And then the, the public said, oh, no, no way. And so right away they became home people. So he wanted somebody to help him out. He had uh, taken on some advertising, the Vic and Sade. You probably never heard of that. That's an old radio show. And he had to do the Vic and Sade advertising campaign. And he wanted somebody to help him on Dixie Dugan. So luckily, I worked for him for a year. And he taught me that, you know, when I went into comic advertising, I didn't, uh, it didn't make any difference to me that a coat buttoned on this side. You know, I'd button them on either side and, uh, and how the collars fit. And he had worked for uh, Maya Both in Chicago. Now, there's a name. You ever heard of the mat service? He, the Maya Both was the mat service. And uh, as opposed to the clip stuff they have today. So he was very conscious of the fact that uh, neckties should fit here. So I uh, polished up for a year. And I did, did most of his advertising. And then I went down to Johnston and Cushing. And they said, well, meantime, um, I was able to get accounts because uh, I said, look, you know, I, I did all this stuff for John Strebel. That's a, known as a ghost. Like Al Scududo was a ghost for uh, Bob Dunn. Uh, a ghost for a ghost for a ghost. Uh, a ghost is the man behind the scenes. The man behind the curtain. Don't look behind that curtain. <laughs> right. The man pulling the strings. Yes, I worked with um, I worked with John Strebel for a year. When I first started out, I used to think that Joe Jinx, the comic strip, Vic, Vic Forsyth, when he would make a man running and diving into the water, you know, and I, I liked the way the hands would go, and the, and the face and the feet, and the way the shoes, you know, the toes curled up. And uh, uh, Mort Drucker, for instance, has made a career out of feet that sort of curl up, and hands, and big thumbs, and uh, had a lot of fun. Stylized and anatomy. Stylized. Did you ever come back to the comic books after your advertising business? Not really. I uh, went back once in a while. I would go in, and I remember uh, going in once, and uh, they said, we got this strip, and we want it um, penciled up, and they penciled it up, and uh, there was a guy named Mort Weisingham, and he was a big man, a round man. He's responsible for a lot of the good stuff. And he says, oh, you've got to um, close all the lines. I said, well, that's like a tracing book, you know, a coloring book. I can't draw like that. I, I said, you know, Joe Kubert, uh, he, he doesn't finish all his lines off for penciling and things, I'm sure. That takes all the fun out of it. So, uh, well, he said, you're not a Joe Kubert. So I said, that's right. <laughs> and they walked out. I'm not a Joe Kubert. 
But no, I never really went back. I uh, went on from there and did uh, textbooks. And uh, if you're freelance, as anybody you've interviewed will tell you, don't count on anything because I started out in the pulps and that, that died on uh, Street and Smith. And luckily somebody said, hey, we'll create a magazine called Seventeen. Seventeen, yeah, well, they saved Street and Smith. Then I got into comic books, and except for the war, the war coming along, that went down the tubes. Then I got into comic advertising, and uh, the, which went for 20 years. You'd say, gee, that's, that's going on forever. In the meantime, I got kids in college, in Princeton yet. So uh, that, then TV came along, and then TV came along, and now, well, you know what's happened since TV. There's all, it went from black TV to color TV, with sound and all the business. If you're in the media, and you, uh, you will find out things change. Be ready to jump from one lily pad to the next. And uh, that's, that's, but it's, that's the way it goes. You expect that. Did you keep up with any of the people in the business? Keep up? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're well, well, uh, you did, did it were still in the comic book business even when you were, when you were in, the, I, um, in the advertising side of the business? Uh, starting out in the comic books, I met most of the guys who were coming through there, like Gil Fox and all the different guys who were coming up. They all stopped down to, with Major Nicholson. Not everybody worked for him. And then in, in Johnstone and Cushing, I worked at home, but I worked in there at, also. And you would get to meet practically everybody that came through. You know, uh, I sat there and watched uh, people like Stan Drake, Dick Brown, uh, Bill Williams, uh, Bill Sacron, uh, Joe King, uh, Austin Briggs, uh, you, uh, awesome guys that I worked with and copied, and um, Al Dorn. Uh, so, um, Did you end up working in any of the shops? Well, that was the only really, it wasn't a shop, it was uh, freelance. There weren't too many guys on, uh, on the payroll. They just had a um, man who did all the coloring and a man who did the lettering who was Ray McGill, who was um, worked with Chick Young in the early days when Chick first started, before Chick was, uh, when Blondie was a dumb Dora type, when she was, before she was married to the uh, Bunt Dagwood Bumstead. And um, they, uh, a lettering man, of course, salesman. And, and uh, Johnstone and Cushing built his reputation on overnight. So the many things you're looking that I did in advertising, sometimes they were pretty good, very rarely ever very good. Lots of times said, did he do that? Well, you never signed them. <clears throat> but you got it done quick. Oh, well, that was it. And I, I did a, a three martini job once, uh, just a spot head, and I don't remember doing it. So after that, no more martini lunches. You know, if you do a drawing and you can't remember, that's um, it's like jumping off a bungee jump, you know, and say, did I tie the string on my feet? <laughs> Boom. I didn't. <laughs> Is this for publication? <laughs> we'll all be in jail. Yeah.